Oh man, oh this guy is so mad. He's, oh man, it's 10 minutes in and he's level 3. Oh, that is what we call sportsmanship, folks. Yeah, this guy didn't lose because he's bad. He lost because we have map hack. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to something a little bit different. Today I have a replay for you. We've got a Pudge game. Now, normally, if Pudge doesn't get banned automatically, I usually end up picking Pudge just to ban him. Now, I mainly play position four, so it's fine with me either way. Whether the enemy team picks him and he gets banned or whether I end up playing him. So, with that being said, let's take a look at the enemy team. Now, in the enemy safe lane, we've got Anti-Mage and Venomancer. Both pretty high physical damage. The enemy off lane is going to be Phoenix Slardar. And the enemy mid is going to be this Void Spirit. So, right away, the idea of playing Pudge versus a hero like Venomancer and Anti-Mage already kind of sucks. AM, if I ever land the hook, he usually is going to have Blink and he could just leave. And Venomancer, if he's any good, he's going to be able to walk away from me by saving Gale. Or he's going to be able to use his Plague Wards to deny the whole area around the safe lane so that I can't angle for a hook. If I do end up landing the hook, he can outslow me by using Venomous Gale and literally just walking away. This lane is hard for me. So what do I do? Well, I get on comms and I say, yo, Underlord, I'm gonna leave you to solo for as long as you can, and I'm gonna go bot. And we're gonna bully them bot, and when you need me back top, just ask and I'll come back top. And the Underlord says, all right, let's do it. Communication with your team is really, really important, especially when you're when you're the support. The Underlord generally is going to be counting on having a support in his lane, so that little back and forth is pretty important. Now, Phoenix has already died. And Phoenix has revealed that he used Fire Spirits. So the plan going into this lane is quite simple. Prevent Phoenix from getting level 2 at all costs. That's the plan. That is quite literally the plan. I'm in Discord with these two nerds. And we have stated as such. The policy is if Phoenix shows in this lane, we kill him. Now Phoenix runs away like a little bitch, so we kill Slardar. Phoenix is still level 1. Now I want to highlight my positioning here. Phoenix knows that he doesn't have dive, and he knows that if we try to kill him, he will die. So he backs off here because it's his only option for survival. He actually was so far out that I didn't see him back off, so I'm running around in the trees just making sure that he's not in XP range, and this guy is over here on the left doing the same thing. Phoenix walks forward, Phoenix is in XP range, call goes out, kill Phoenix. Phoenix is still level 1. Not even halfway to level 2. At this point, both mids are level 3. I highlight this because one of the things that I love about the position 4 is... The position 4 is one of the only heroes on the team that actually gets to make strategic decisions as to where their hero is going to be. You know, the mid has to play the mid lane, the safe lane has to play the safe lane, the off lane has to play the off lane. You can lane swap if you want to, and it can be quite good to lane swap, but my point here is all of your core heroes are going to need resources, and there are three lanes that are abundant with resources, so your cores are going to be in one of those lanes, and the position 5 needs to be securing the carry's farm to the best of their ability, which means the only person who their position is not set in stone is the position 4. I have XP per minute up here because I want to show you that this Phoenix only has 33 XP per minute. And right here, I know that Diving Tower is a death sentence, but the thing is, as long as Phoenix is level 1, he literally cannot escape. And so I tell my friends that I'm dying to kill this Phoenix, and I just ask them to back me up. Phoenix dies before I do, which means he doesn't get any XP, so he's still level 1. The reason this is worth is because the Phoenix is still completely killable. He has no escape yet. And once he hits level 2, he can survive. But you know what? It's 3 minutes in, and he's still level 1. So we come back to bully him. Let's take a look at what's happening top. The Underlord has obviously been denied a little bit of XP because he's behind on the mid. The Venomancer has in fact leveled Plague Wards, which is what he would use to be shutting me down, and the Anti-Mage has a point in blank. My kill potential in this lane is pretty much exclusively based on whether or not I could actually land a hook on the Venomancer, and that would be with me and him, uh, the Underlord, splitting XP. Chances are, if we were splitting XP, we'd both be level 2, and currently I don't have boots. So currently, the Venomancer is faster than me. I would only have level 1 
rot if I was sitting in this lane dueling XP. Venomancer has a slow. Venomancer could quite literally walk away from me. We would need a point to pit of malice just in order to catch him. At that point, in order to take a fight, we need 200 mana on Underlord versus an Anti-Mage. That's just a bad plan. It's really easy for this plan to go wrong. It's not that we couldn't have taken this. It's not that we couldn't have killed the Venomancer a couple of times. It's that in order to kill the Venomancer, because of how much slow they have, Underlord absolutely has to use 200 mana and dedicate skill points to grabbing Pit of Malice. Without me being there, all he really needs to do is soak XP from the wave, get a side pull off if he can, and he doesn't really have to worry about too much. This Underlord's job is just to, really just to play it safe while the rest of us do our thing. Phoenix is still level one. Carrie has three kills as well as free farm. They see the Lich and Starter says, you know what, hey, I'm strong. Let's kill Lich. Let's just see how this goes. Slaughter dies again. And this Phoenix is still level 1. Underlord, level 4, farming under his tower, letting the wave push in. Venomancer gets a side pull off, but it wasn't stacked, so this is going to push again, and as long as Underlord doesn't die, he's going to be just fine. Once again, Phoenix is still level 1, and they actually are so desperate for Phoenix level 2 that they walk over here to hit a, hit a jungle creep to get Phoenix level 2. Is Phoenix going to salve him? Yeah, Phoenix salves him. Phoenix spends a healing salve just to get level 2 from Slardar in the jungle. That is how desperate they are. Anyways, quick look at what's going on on the top lane. Remember, the purpose of the tri lane was not actually to just completely dominate the off lane, but it was rather uh, sitting two heroes top with Sabotage Underlord, whilst not really helping the rest of the team. So the idea with the tri lane was, if nothing else, I could stack and pull while Lich traded. We weren't even intending to bully them this hard. We were just intending for Underlord to be over here with an XP advantage. He has his ulti, he has Firestorm, he has Soul Ring, he has full health, he's out-leveling his anti-mage. And let's even go take a look and see how he's doing on CS. He is losing to the Anti-Mage, which is a little unfortunate. Not too unexpected. After all, AM has Quelling Blade, Agility Hero, two Wraith Bands. It's pretty hard for Underlord to compete. But this Underlord is not sad or poor by any stretch of the imagination. He's doing pretty good, and that's the whole point. The Slaughter, on the other hand, still level 3. It's important as a position 4 to know when and where you can be effective. Because the best thing I could do for this Underlord was to not soak his XP. The thing about the Anti-Mage lane is that there comes a point where Anti-Mage will not die. The only thing that we do by trying to kill Anti-Mage is, well, burn our mana for him. We use our spells, that's 200 mana on Underlord, and how much is Hook? 110? If we try to fight Anti-Mage, we have to use 310 mana right out the gate, and then Anti-Mage, any auto attacks he lands are just going to burn a tremendous amount of mana as well. And then he blinks away, he doesn't die, he gets a ring of health, and at some point, like this Anti-Mage, we'd need 4 or 5 heroes to kill. We need the Wind Ranger to, in order to kill him. So, it's not worth duo laning against this Anti-Mage, because there just is going to come a, a point pretty early on into the match where we can do nothing. Whereas this Underlord, he can go over here. He should be firestorming the wave and backing off. I guess this works too. This, oh man, it's 10 minutes in and he's level 3. Oh man, all oh, these guys were so sad. I didn't realize quite how sad they were. We knew they were sad in the match, but we didn't realize exactly how sad. Underlord, still over here, still free farming, still out farming the anti-mage, controlling him, pressing the tier 2, the Anti-Mage cannot leave this lane. Some some core has to be here absorbing farm. As long as the Underlord is pushing it out. Underlord decides, you know what? I've done a lot of work top. I'm going to take mid-tier 1. This Underlord is incredibly strong right now. And that's what I want to point out about good supports. That my decision to leave top was probably the best thing for Underlord. And it helped secure several kills for the carry. So the, what I did as a support this match was enable my cores. That's what you're supposed to do as a support. So I take this game, 
it's just an excellent example of what a position four can do when they know the strengths and weaknesses of their hero. Now you may have noticed the Venomancer did in fact just waste all. It's worth saying that they had two ancient players, two smurfs, and one genuinely new player. The Venomancer was the only player who was actually new. On our team, we had a, a legitimate Archon 2 Underlord, and our mid was Ancient 2. Uh, me and the Arc Warden, so the Pudge and the Arc Warden, are both mid Legend, and the Lich is low Archon. So we were definitely at the MMR disadvantage for this match. So the reason that we came away with a win, despite having a weak laning, fa weak laning stage on paper and lower MMR, is just because of the strategy that we implemented. The match just kind of goes on for here. Uh, the Anti-Mage does end up getting a Battle Fury and applying quite a bit of lane pressure. Uh, we do end up winning because they're too far behind to catch back up. Oh. oh, let's watch that again. Let's watch that again. I see the Wraith going for him, and you tie the hook. Mm. Mm. That was a satisfying one. That was a very, very satisfying hook. 15 heat, but 18 minutes into the game. Oh! Yeah, I remember this, gank. So, we've been chasing the Anti-Mage for quite a while now. And, and the Anti-Mage accuses us of having map hack. The Anti-Mage did not actually know that uh, Gleipnir was, could just ground targeted and that you didn't need vision. There it is, boys. Thinks we have map hack. By the way, he wasn't telling the anti-mage to guess how he saw him. What he meant by that, when, when he said guess, all he meant was he guessed and used the Gleipnir on the ground. But of course, the anti-mage assumes that it has to be map hack. Which is kind of funny, because the anti-mage is actually a smirk. Unable to comprehend how a legend player with a ground targeted ability managed to root him. <laughs> oh man, oh this guy is so mad. So anyway, if you did enjoy this video, please leave a like or comment. Consider subscribing to the channel, or honestly, I'm a small YouTube channel. Sharing the video is definitely the biggest thing that you could do giving other people the opportunity to say whether or not they like my content. I certainly enjoy playing position 4 and I love shutting people down and I'd like to do videos like this showcasing you know, strategic decisions that I make in some games that might seem a little wild like tri laning in 2022 uh, but of course these things were in the meta once because they have power. Um, they're potentially strong strats and knowing when they're viable is pretty useful information. Anyway. I'll be back soon with another uh, another addition to learning learning Dota 2. We're gonna be focusing on we're gonna break down the positions a little bit more uh, in our next video. So uh, I look forward to that one. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you later.